Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's panel on the road to a more resilient future and sustainable support for Syrian refugees. Organized by the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in New York on the sidelines of the 76th session of the United Nations, of Gen uh, United Nations General Assembly. Thank you for joining us today at this uh, in-person event during these challenging times. And thanks to Ambassador James Lee and his team for making it possible. My name is Betül Yürük. I'm a Turkish journalist covering the United Nations for eight years, both in New York and Geneva, and I'll be your moderator today. And today's topic is Syria. The war in Syria has created one of the worst humanitarian crises of our time. And as the war has entered its 11th year, there are now 13.4 million Syrians in need of humanitarian help, which is more than half of the population. And more than 5.6 million Syrians have fled to neighboring countries, including Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan. And currently, my home country, Turkey, is also hosting more than 3.6 million Syrian refugees. And today, our discussion will focus on uh, identifying best practices of humanitarian help and exploring ways for sustainable support uh, from the perspectives of governments, NGOs, and academia. Without further delay, uh, allow me to invite Ambassador James C., Director General of Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in New York, for his opening remarks. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ms. Bedu. Uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Uh, please allow me to begin by thanking moderator and uh, our panelists for uh, making this seminar possible. This seminar was organized in response to uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres call for assisting Syrian refugees. As the world gradually recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and refocus on implementing uh, the SDGs. There are still tens of millions of refugees around the world for their daily survival struggle. Among them, almost 7 million Syrian refugees are still in need of our support. However, the pandemic and the uncertain economic outlook have, un, uh, have compounded the hardship on the ground, fostering global support for Syrian refugee is now more important than ever. Since 2017, my country, Taiwan, has teamed up with like-minded countries and partners to provide humanitarian assistance and implement capacity building projects for Syrian refugee. In the past eight years, we have implemented more than 60 programs providing basic education, vocational training for women, mental health support for youth, housing support, water and sanitation, removal of dangerous explosives, and food security projects for Syrian refugee. Compared to other countries, the resources we contribute in this regard are still relatively limited. But this doesn't stop us from committing ourselves to searching for best practice and creative solution. This is why we brought together today several experts to share their insights. And I hope their perspective will inspire more others to join this important efforts. We greatly appreciate the presence of Ambassador uh, Inga Ronda King, uh, whose country, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, is currently the UN Security, member, uh, Security Council member. It has dedicated itself to showing solidarity and support 
for refugees around the world. And we are honored to hear Ambassador King's keynote speech today. We are also grateful for Ms. Batu, uh, a well-known expert on Syrian issue, uh, has agreed to moderate this panel. Uh, as we are all lucky to have your expertise uh, guiding us uh, today's discussion. On the note, I'm looking forward to some uh, wonderful, awesome insights from our panel participants. Ambassador Paul uh, Beres for Hills will talk about the sovereign order of Malta's dedication to assisting Syrian refugee. Am Ambassador Beres for Hills is a very knowledgeable diplomat and uh, uh, educator who care deeply about those in need. In addition, uh, Dr. Uh, Yanis Van Amo from Columbia University uh, will also uh, will offer his uh, inputs on how technology can be utilized uh, to deliver humanitarian assistance in a more efficient way, uh, which is another timely topic uh, given the current hardship on the ground. I also want to thank Dr. Chiu Zhenyu uh, of the Taiwan Rehani Center for World Citizens. Dr. Chu will share the story behind how the center was founded and why it will be an instrumental as a useful reference uh, for building a resilient community, especially in circumstances involving limited resources and complex culture and political factors. Dr. Chu is an um, innovative architect, a caring educator, and uh, a dedicated humanitarian uh, worker. Uh, what, ha what has always impressed me most about uh, Dr. Chu is his dedication for using his voice and influence to help Syrian refugees uh, stand on their own feet. He not only dreams, but then take the steps necessary to make them a reality. So in closing, I hope you will all enjoy today's seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Lee, for your remarks. Before I invite our keynote speaker, Ambassador Inga Ronda King, permanent representative of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to the United Nations, uh, I just want to say that, as you all know, St. Vincent and the Grenadines had devastating volcanic eruptions back in April. Our thoughts are with the people of your country, Ambassador, and hope your recovery efforts are going well. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, Ambassador Lee, for inviting me. And thank you to the, moder the, the other panelists that will join us shortly and welcome everyone. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Let me open by commending Taiwan and the partners gathered here for their efforts to alleviate humanitarian suffering on the ground. Humanitarian work is noble and difficult. It requires not giving, not just giving, but also listening to better understand the needs of specific groups of people. Your work is made even more difficult today and even more necessary due to the disproportionate impact of climate change on dire humanitarian situations. The COVID-19 pandemic has also put greater strain on the most vulnerable among us and also underscores the need for more humanitarian action. 
I was also told that I should speak for 10, seven to 10 minutes, but my statement is approximately 12 minutes, and I beg your indulgence at the outset because the plight of Syrians is an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. St. Vincent and the Grenadines has consistently supported the renewal of the Syrian cross-border mechanism, as well as the scaling up of cross-line modalities, in line with the mantra that we must leave no one behind. Despite our best efforts, though, it is clear that many people are being left behind, the majority of whom are women and children. Ten years of war in Syria have claimed the lives of nearly a half a million people and precipitated the world's largest refugee and displacement crisis. The conflict has further had the resulting effect of producing one of the worst humanitarian emergencies of our time. Behind these humanitarian emergencies lie a web of factors to consider, including the need for a political solution to end the conflict, the dire situ security situation, the terrorist threat, human rights issues, the bad and further deteriorating socioeconomic situation, climate change, and COVID-19 pandemic. Security, Security Council Resolution 2254, adopted in 2015, underscores the critical need to build conditions for the safe, dignified, and voluntary return of refugees and internally displaced persons, IDPs, to their places of origin. Creating an environment that enables refugees and IDPs to exercise their right of return requires the advancement of a Syrian-owned and Syrian-led political process, which is the only sustainable solution to the crisis. Without a political resolution, the security situation will remain volatile, socio-economic recovery will be hindered, and reconstruction and rehabilitation of areas which have been affected by bombardment will be indefinitely postponed. Absent the improvement of any of these components, the Syrian people will have nothing to return to. The lack of progress on the political process is thereby deeply concerning. After multiple sessions, the Syrian Constitutional Committee has made very little progress in its negotiations and is nowhere close to drafting a new constitution. It is therefore imperative that all parties remain dedicated to working together in a spirit of mutual respect and compromise. There must also be a commitment to ensuring the full engagement in the committee of all segments of society and that the representation of women who are involved in the process remains at the minimum threshold of 30% to ensure sustainable and equitable peace for all Syrians. The greatest factor determining the return of Syrian refugees and IDPs in, in, is the country's security situation. Increased hostilities in the last few months have resulted in numerous civilian casualties, damage to and destruction of civilian objects, in particular health and education facilities, and very recently even further displacement in areas such as Dara Alba Balad. The situation is alarming and an immediate nationwide ceasefire is urgently needed for civilian protection and to foster an environment conducive to return. The presence of Security Council designated terrorist entities in the country also presents legitimate security concerns that have necessitated military operations. Resolution 2254 recognizes the negative impact of terrorism and reiterates the call in Resolution 2249 for member states to prevent and suppress terrorist acts. Syria 
should not be a safe haven or a breeding ground for terrorism, which served as a significant driver of displacement. If terrorists are allowed to regroup and terrorism is allowed to take root once more, displacement will be exacerbated as refugees and IDPs will not return if their protection is threatened. Safeguarding human rights is an imperative. The return of refugees is also dependent on assurances that upon their return, they will not be subject to arbitrary detention or to any other violations of their fundamental rights and freedoms. As such, the efforts of the Secretary General's Special Envoy concerning the issues of detainees, abductees, and missing persons are of critical importance. Making concrete steps on these issues will serve as expressions of goodwill, cultivate trust, and undoubtedly promote reconciliation within Syria. The country's rapid socio-economic downturn perpetuates the current instability. 12.4 million people are estimated to be food insecure, and shortages of other essential commodities are increasing placing the Syrian people in a perilous position. The overall situation is further compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, and water crisis. And I emphasize this repeatedly. Being a uh, uh, um, climate change activist, but drought and other troubling factors have led to critically low water levels in the Euphrates River creating the worst drought in seven decades, which now threatens lives and livelihoods. Humanitarian aid, therefore, remains a critical lifeline for millions, particularly those residing in overcrowded IDP camps and other informal settlements. Consequently, consequently sorry, aid access facilitated by cross-border mechanism as reauthorized by Security Council Resolution 2585, as well as other indispensable modalities are vital to the humanitarian response. Intrinsically related to the issue of Syria's socio-economic downturn is that of the imposition of unilateral coercive measures. The imposition of politically motivated sanctions has worsened the humanitarian disaster and stymied the Syrian government's ability to respond to the global pandemic and adequately support Syrians. The effectiveness of the humanitarian exemptions has been called into question by many states and humanitarian actors on the ground, including ICRC, as a result of the overcompliance and the bureaucracy involved in obtaining exemptions in a timely manner, especially regarding banking. The Security Council in Resolution 2585 has acknowledged that Syria is a country in a complex humanitarian emergency and has called upon all member states to respond with practical steps to address the urgent need of the Syrian people in light of the profound socio-economic and humanitarian impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is our view that these practical steps ought to be to, or to include the lifting of sanctions in consideration of their adverse impact on the civilian population and their incompatibility with international law. Unquestionably, the country's current socio-economic socio condition is unfavorable to the return of Syrian refugees. There remains a strong case for reconstruction in Syria. The conflict has devastated Syria, and the return of refugees and IDPs is therefore greatly dependent on the country's reconstruction. Homes, schools, medical facilities, and other essential infrastructure have been decimated, depriving millions of the fundamental human rights to education and an adequate standard of living, inclusive of healthcare and other social services. 
vulnerabilities are high and women and children are most at risk. Without reconstruction, IDPs will be forced to stay away from their places of origin and refugees will remain dependent on the benevolence of neighboring, neighboring countries such as Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, which is currently the largest host community of refugees, and many others. In 2019, the United Nations estimated the cost of reconstruction at $250 billion. Syria's arduous road to recovery is thus heavily reliant on the international community's goodwill in providing reconstruction aid that is desperately needed for the benefit of the Syrian people. Some states have hinged reconstruction aid on a political transition being firmly underway. However, considering the stagnant political situation in the country, this approach may need to be re-examined to consider a possible incremental or a step-by-step -step approach which sees a gradual disbursement of reconstruction funds or other support for reconstruction and rehabilitation projects in exchange for meaningful political reforms. Before concluding, allow me to underscore that the international community ought to be mindful of the responsibility being shouldered by those states that are hosting Syrian refugees and should extend multi-dimensional support to them. Additionally, host states should respect and fully abide by their obligations to refugees enshrined in international law, including the 1951 Convention relating to, relating to the status of refugees and the 1967 Protocol thereto. Indeed, refugee protection should be a shared responsibility and greater international cooperation and solidarity is needed to assist refugees. In 2016, the General Assembly adopted the New, the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants. The declaration acknowledged that large movements of refugees and migrants have political, economic, social, developmental, humanitarian, and human rights ramifications which cross all borders. It rightly called for global approaches and global solutions as capacities and resources vary and impact states' abilities to respond to refugee crises. Finally, in conclusion, I would like to emphasize that above all, we must address the root causes of displacement in the case of Syria, this requires an urgent political solution to finally put an end to the protracted conflict. Despite seemingly insurmountable challenges, the Syrian people continue to display an extraordinary resilience. There is much that can be done to support Syria and its people. The international community bears a great responsibility to engage in a pragmatic way by prioritizing the people of Syria and setting aside geopolitical disputes which have compounded the complexities of the conflict. This dictates the removal of all unauthorized foreign forces in respect of Syria's sovereignty and territorial integrity. The country should not continue to be a battlefield for geopolitical confrontation. We must put the people of Syria first and pursue people-centered, long-term and sustainable solutions to address the plight of all Syrians. Aid is palliative. It gets a family by for the day, the week, the month. It is a matter of immediacy and survival. It is absolutely necessary. But as a Security Council member, we have to solve the underlying political and indeed geopolitical issues that have given rise to the crisis in Syria in the first place against the backdrop of runaway climate change, 
the COVID-19 pandemic and the stalling economy. The international community also has a duty to help not hinder the country's development after years of destruction. The case for reconstruction and development aid in Syria is clear and imperative and clear and imperative and efforts towards this end should be undertaken hand in hand with humanitarian efforts. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for your remarks. Now we will begin our panel discussion, and I'd like to invite our panelists to the podium, please. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, here with me, we have three distinguished panelists. Uh, Ambassador Paul Beresford Hill uh, from uh, the Permanent Observer Mission of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta to the United Nations. Uh, Dr. Yanis Ben Amor, sitting in the middle, Executive Director at the Center for Sustainable Development in the Earth Institute at Columbia University. And we have Dr. Chiu Chen Yu, he just traveled from Turkey to New York, and he's the founding director and principal architect of Taiwan Rehanla Center for World Citizens in Turkey. So we'll start a panel discussion, and I'd like to open this panel with a following question for uh, all of our panelists. Ambassador Dr. Yanis, Dr. Cho, uh, when we look at uh, all the conflicts around the world, in this case, the Syrian war, I think we can all agree that uh, they have become much longer protracted and solutions are getting harder and harder to find. And after more than 10 years of war, life has become harder uh, than ever for the Syrian refugees. So the question is, are the Syrian refugees getting the support they need. Is the international community doing enough to support them? Ambassador, let's begin with you, please. Thank you. Uh, that's a very difficult question because mm. the support of the international community, uh, especially towards those who are displaced, those who are underprivileged, has always been a very, very powerful and strong force. And it's one of the reasons why the United Nations was established in the first place, uh, to provide us all with an opportunity to give a voice uh, to those communities and individuals um, who, who have lost their voice as a result of conflict and internal and external war. Uh, are we doing enough? Uh, we can never do enough. Um, the United Nations very often is criticized because of its perceived um, inactivity, because of its perceived lack of power to make the kind of radical changes which very often, simplistically, people will expect of a world organization and a world body, certainly, of the stature of the United Nations. However, my, my answer to that is that without the United Nations and without that forum and without that platform for those voices, the world would be in a, a far, far sorrier place. And certainly uh, the people of Syria uh, would not have the opportunity to have their plight discussed in the way in which we're able to do so today. Uh, and so, I, I would say yes, we can do and we should be doing much, much more, um, but I think we are also limited, and we're limited by the partisan politics that unfortunately control and in some ways undermine uh, the principles of the United Nations. 
thank you for, for the question. Um, very simply, I would say we are absolutely not doing enough as a result. The problem is still there 10 years later. Uh, and I will give you two, two examples. Um, I'm coming from a country, Tunisia, that feels very close to the Syrian problem since somehow, due to trickle effect, we probably created it. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, in December and January of 2011, so December 2010, January 2011, my country went through a peaceful revolution. We ousted our dictator, uh, Zine al Abdin Ben Ali. In a very simple way, we were quite lucky. Our dictator left within days, probably because Tunisia did not represent a geopolitical uh, advantage for some powers, and uh, he was allowed to leave. As a result, we had a bloodless coup and uh, were able to move on. We inspired a lot of our brothers and sisters in other countries, uh, Egypt and obviously Syria. And unfortunately, Syria, it created the situation that we know. Uh, their dictator decided not to leave. And so 10 years later, they're still living in this situation. So the first issue that I would say is that there is no timeline. When the Syrian refugees started to arrive in your country, the idea was this would be a temporary situation. And the provisions that were given by your country were for temporary, you know, few months. Then all of a sudden, 2014 came along, and the, and the Syrians were still in Turkey. To this day, we still don't know how much longer is this going to last. So that adds to the problem. How long is this going to go for? Second, every, as you pointed out, every month, every six months, there seems to be another crisis. It was Venezuela, now it's Afghanistan. So who is thinking about the Syrians? Now we have to think about the Afghanis and who is going to host them? What is going to happen to those who want to flee? The women, the children. So the Syrian refugees are in a very, very difficult situation because of that. And so to go back to my original answer, we are not doing enough. Thank you, Dr. Yanis. Dr. Cho, your thoughts, please. You came from Turkey. You have first-hand accounts and experiences. You work with the Syrian refugees. Um, thank you for your question. Do you think it's possible I can use the slides? And I, actually, I have a few uh, slides. And can you, yes, we will also uh, have the presentations. Okay, sure. uh, uh, my first question, okay, as sure. uh, all our panelists answer, yes. if you could just, you know, like uh, answer that briefly, okay, we can sure. move to the next stage. Thank you. Um, because I work as an architect, and also I work as a professor in Peking University, and we all believe it's the, the best university in Turkey. But allow me to say, I feel as an architect, as architect from architectural professions, what we have done in Turkey is so little and so limited. Um, five years ago, I started to work for Syrian refugee crisis in Turkey. And then suddenly I realized the building we built, the Taiwan Rahana Center for World Citizens, is the first building in this kind in responding to the Syrian refugee crisis. First building. But during that time, we already passed six years since we have a Syrian refugee crisis. Architecture field, architectural professions in Turkey, we haven't done anything yet. And this is what I understand. I think there are far much more we should do. And there are far much more we should work together no matter where we come from, no matter our religious, gender, or age. Eight million refugees, four million in Turkey, the other four million on the border side, the buffer zones in Syria. Why eight million refugees become a crisis? Because no one believes it is our responsibility and then it becomes a crisis. If all the world citizens believe this is our responsibility. This is, we should share the burden. We should find a solution to deal with. Eight million, 18 million should never be a crisis if we all believe this is our responsibility. And this is what I believe. 
Hopefully I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Now I'd like to turn to Mr. Ambassador. Ambassador, can you please expand on medical, social, and psychological support for Syrian refugee, refugees during the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic? I'll, sure. Don't be worried about the number of pages I'm holding. The print is very large. <laughs> so we should be all right. Um, yes, support. Support for people in crisis, support for people in trouble. Um, look at these goals. The Sustainable Development Goals, when they were created a number of years ago, they were touted as being our hope for the future. They were the dream that we were all aspiring towards and that we were ultimately going to put in place some way or another. And we were going to devote all of our efforts, all of our time, attention, our, our, our treasure, and our talent to make these happen across the world by 3030, by 2030. If I were a refugee in a camp in Turkey or in Lebanon or in a displaced person center in northwest Syria, at worst I would think this was a joke, a very bad, bad joke. At best maybe an irony. Because when you look at what we want for the world, only 10 years from now, clean water sanitation, gender equality, good health well-being, reduced inequalities, work, zero hunger, no poverty. Uh-uh. That's not what is happening in Syria. And sadly, it's not what is happening in many other parts of the world. Is there hope? Yes, we can always have hope. If we deny ourselves hope, then we might as well pack our bags and vanish into the hinterland. There is always hope. But the problems are so so large, so magnified, and in a sense, the lives that are being affected are being affected so terribly. The conflict in Syria has had grave psychological consequences for children. Many young children who should be having a good time, enjoying their young lives, have developed post-traumatic disorders because they're constantly living in fear of being bombed in the next attack or being destroyed in some form or fashion. The result will have a long-term impact involving whole generations. The health system struggles to provide aid as Northwest Syria suffers from a deteriorated public health provision due to weak governance bad security arrangements, specific targeting of health facilities by military actors, many of them respectable members of the United Nations, and a lack of human resources. And to make matters worse, the outbreak of COVID-19 in Syria has further exacerbated a humanitarian situation in communities that have seen their lives ravaged by this long-running conflict. Since the beginning of the war, the organization that I represent, the Sovereign Order of Malta, a permanent observer at the UN with sui juris status in international law, we have continued to provide humanitarian aid under very, very difficult circumstances. We have a worldwide relief agency called Malteza International, 
and we have been working with local partners inside Syria and outside to provide life-saving humanitarian assistance, including improving water and sanitation, providing urgent medical care for women, children, and displaced families, organizing medical assistance, including WASH projects, which stands for water, sanitation, and hygiene. We operate programs in camps in Turkey and in Lebanon, where we provide both medical support as well as educational support. And we are continuing with the implementation of preventative measures to stop the spread of disease and illness among the internally displaced population. Some of these measures include running and reinforcing health capacities in hospitals and primary care centers, distributing water hygiene articles, helping to repair very poor sanitation infrastructure in the refugee camps and informal settlements. In northwest Syria, we are responding to the health sector emergencies on a daily basis, supporting five general hospitals, maternity and children's hospitals in addition. We support nine primary health care centers, a blood bank, two physiotherapy centers, and a central medical oxygen generator. There's also assistance in the camps for refugees and displaced people by war, such as housing Syrian civilians in Lebanon and in Turkey. Malteser International have suitably equipped their staff so that they can continue their reception, accompaniment, and integration tasks. In the Middle East, although the situation is aggravated by a lack of materials, our volunteers and healthcare professionals continue their work, especially helping young people who need hospitalization, frequently at great personal risk. Since July 2020, we've mobilized resources to tackle the spread of COVID-19. And on different levels, we have firstly focused on basic healthcare support by distributing personal emergency kits to nearly a quarter of a million patients in hospitals. We've spent millions upon millions of euro in providing care, assistance, aid, and support for all of the people who appeal to us for help. There's so much, so much more that we can do. We're so grateful to the aid supplied by the United Nations, the United Nations agencies. We're so grateful for the support of other actors in this NGO humanitarian response, including the International Red Cross, the International Rescue, as well as the Red Crescent societies, all of which are working flat out to provide help, support, assistance to alleviate the pain and suffering of these people. At the end of the day, the question was asked, are we doing enough? Nope, we're definitely not doing enough by any stretch of the imagination. And as was pointed out, Syria is not alone in its needs. There are communities all over the world, including in this very country of the United States of America, where there are populations and communities for whom these sustainable goals have yet to be realized. It's a tragedy, but it's a tragedy which we all must share. It's a tragedy which demands that organizations like the UN galvanize their members, particularly their wealthier members, to pass by some of the political and partisan and intergovernmental issues uh, that seem to occupy so much of their time and focus on the real needy citizenry of the world. 
The Sovereign Order of Malta used to be its own country, the island of Malta. We're not there anymore. And very often people will say to me at the United Nations, well, who do you represent? You don't have a citizenry. You don't have territory per se. Uh, who, who are your people? And as Ambassador Rhonda King said, the citizenry that we are concerned about are those who are left behind. Those are the people that we most care about. And we don't care about politics. We don't care about one-upmanship. We don't care about the geopolitical status of one nation versus another and who can get their rockets sooner or quicker into the air. We care about providing water, good health, well-being, sustainable cities and sustainable communities. And it's an uphill battle for all of us, but at the same time, let me just hit on a couple of things. What do we advocate? We advocate that there should be a better coverage of COVID-19 vaccination, particularly for the citizens of Syria. Those political actors who engage in conflict should prioritize the health needs of the population above political gain. Two, adequate financial resources must be allocated to tackle the spread of the pandemic in Syria and to fill the gaps of a preparation and response plan which doesn't really exist. A challenge which perhaps should and could be coordinated by the United Nations. Thirdly, there must be a comprehensive and intercluster response that includes all the humanitarian actors that focus everybody's attention on a coordinated plan for recovery, for resettlement, and for providing a basic life for the people of Syria whose lives have been so displaced. And finally, the resilience of local communities should be supported in order to avoid additional waves of internally displaced persons and refugees. Those seeking the chance to rebuild their lives in foreign lands, but always with the hope that their own country once more will provide them with a safe haven. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I'd like to turn to Dr. Yanis, uh, but uh, just before I give the floor to you, Dr. Yanis, uh, during the pandemic, I know you'll be talking about technology and how we could use technology to help the Syrian refugees. And technology has been more important than ever during the pandemic for all of us. We all have turned to technologies, held our meetings, via Zoom, even did our grocery shopping with our smartphones and uh, apps. So uh, if you could tell us how we could use technology uh, to improve the quality of life of these Syrian refugees, we would appreciate that. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you so much. With your permission, I will stay here because I have a presentation. It'll be easier for me to see it than from the podium. So... Um, so today I was asked to discuss a Columbia University project that is currently happening in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, and I will focus exclusively on the, uh, the Turkish side. In um, we realized that a lot of the Syrian refugees who were in these countries actually had access to health services that they didn't even knew they had access to. So for example, in, in Turkey, any registered migrant and refugee has access to the exact same health benefits than a Turkish national. But of course, if you don't speak the local language and you're not aware of your rights, then you might not access those services. And so we, we decided that one of the ways that we could help uh, not only actually the refugee and migrant population, but also the youth 
and some of the disadvantaged local population, like LGBT, um, was to develop an app that would actually synthesize all of that you have access to uh, just by knowing where you are located and what service you would like to access. So, like I said, the issue that we were trying to solve is that to many young people, including locals, face barriers in accessing youth-friendly health information and healthcare. Um, Differing gender and cultural norms, languages, laws, and stigma pose additional challenges for young refugees in host countries. So there is a need to implement more innovative, youth-friendly, gender-sensitive, and widely used solutions to address the health education and healthcare needs of young people in forced migration settings. So our project, which we called REACH, which stands for Refugees Act and Communicate for Health, aims to bridge that gap in health literacy and healthcare access among refugees and local youth via digital technology in Turkey. So the idea is that if you have any question about a health problem, instead of going to look out for a solution, you would have that tool, you can type in a keyword and it would tell you, okay, this is what you would like to know about COVID. This is what you would like to know about gender-based violence. Do you still need help? then we'll help you by finding where the healthcare service the closest to you is, is located. So with a, a strong youth-adult partnership, the initiative includes stakeholder meetings, mixed method study in each country, a quantitative survey, qualitative studies with youth, as well as qualitative interviews with service providers and policymakers, followed by a photo exhibition panel and a production of policy reports and scientific uh, publications. So basically what we wanted to do is to be as integrative as possible. Not Columbia University going into Turkey and telling the Syrian refugees, okay, this is the tool for you, now use it. We wanted a participative approach and I will show you now how that happened. But we also wanted to work with the local stakeholders because there's no point in reinventing the wheel. We are coming in 2019 and, and many Actually, uh, stakeholders have been working in this field for, for so many years before us. So I want to quickly acknowledge who our partners were. Uh, obviously, Columbia University, also our local center in Istanbul, CGC. Um, Bidi's Association, the Istanbul University, Faculty of Medicine, and very importantly, none of this would have been possible without the generous support of Taiwan uh, through the ICDF, the International Cooperation and Development Fund, that has funded the entire project from the start. So, thank you to Taiwan and its people. We started with a stakeholders meeting that was already two years ago, and the idea was to bring all of the experts in the room and basically understand what the situation was, so we didn't start from zero, and also we were not duplicating the efforts of, of others. So from there, we used something that was developed actually at uh, Stanford University, I believe in the 90s. The idea is that when you are talking about a traumatic episode in your life, sometimes doing it through photography is a lot easier to be able to, to discuss an issue. So we launched a photo voice study. Um, the study aimed to assess youth's access to health information and healthcare in addition to their perspective on using digital health technologies. So we would give them cameras, we would explain exactly what we wanted them to do, photograph your daily challenges, whether it is accessing healthcare, what is your daily life, going to school, not going to school, how you live, where you live. Um, and then we would organize focus group discussions with the photos and then they were a would be able to discuss these problems and from there we would understand what type of solution we could, we could be bringing. And so we organized many of those, mostly with uh, um, refugees in Istanbul, but we always wanted to make sure that we also had local youth because the idea was the problems of one could be the problem of the other. And so how do we uh, provide an integrative solution? So then came the challenge of COVID. Um, we started our project in September 2019. And then of course, in March, the whole world came to a shutdown. We had actually planned to organize a photo exhibit of the photos that the young migrants and the young locals were taking to express their problems. And we had this amazing event organized in Istanbul, uh, which ended up being online. It's incredible how creative you can be with, with technology, actually. So the entire event was through Zoom including a virtual visit of a virtual gallery with the photos, where people could just go walk around and look at the photos, which we were able to organize, thanks to the creativity of some designers. Um, then, because we wanted to disseminate some of the findings, a year ago, 
around the time after the UN General Assembly, we organized a high-level stakeholders meeting, uh, health promotion via digital technologies among young refugees, and we invited uh, several experts from the field, and we presented some of these results. So, from there, we decided to move into the actual product, the app, okay? And same thing, unfortunately, we could not all meet in the same room, so everything happened via Zoom. Uh, from multiple cities in Turkey as well as from New York. Uh, we even had at some point Taiwan involved and uh, the idea was that they were presenting some of, the, some of the issues and we would come up with solutions together. And so from there, here are some of the, uh, of the features that we felt were really important to include in the app. So I'm not going to read everything, but um, it had to be available in both format Android and, and iPhone because Android is the most used. Uh, not everybody has an iPhone, so that was important. It needed to be free to download. Uh, a lot of the f features needed to be offline because you don't always have access to internet, as you can imagine. And so, for example, all of the information uh, that you could type in needed to be available almost like an online Wikipedia uh, with the health information. It will never ask you for personal identification, so you don't have to worry about your information living on the phone or being shared with someone. Um, you have the opportunity to create multiple users, each user not being able to see what the other one does. For example, if there is a husband and a wife and the wife is looking at gender-based violence, the husband would not be able to see that. Um, so we wanted to increase health literacy, promote healthy behaviors, improve access. There was an entire section on COVID that we had to develop. And one of the important things is then the geolocation. So it would, it would ask permission to find you on a map. And then if you actually wanted to go to a clinic, then it would tell you, okay, this is the closest clinic to you. These are the services that are available. And is there a translator? Because, you know, the Syrians speak Arabic and the Turkish speaks Turkish. And so the language is not the same. Um, in theory, there are translators available in a lot of the clinics, but that's not always the case. And then one of the final features was almost like a Yelp review of the visit. So in other words, once you are done with it, tell us, how were you treated? Did they leave you for five hours because they know you are Syrian and, and they let all of the Turkish go in front of you? Uh, were you mis mishandled, etc.? And so we would not give the report on an individual basis, meaning doctor by doctor, but it's important for us to do that on an institutional level. So this clinic has a bad rating because a lot of the Syrians who go there say that they have not been treated well. And I will finish. So this is some of the content that we are dealing with. So healthcare systems, uh, physical health, social health, mental health, environmental health, COVID-19. Uh, so again, all of these, you can, you can just put in a keyword and then you would have entire information. And now I will finish with two slides showing you how this actually looks like. Um, it's a very simple uh, interface. We actually developed it with Turkish developers. We were very proud of that. Um, and uh, so this is my final slide. The app will be available for download everywhere in the world uh, next month in October, and we're hoping for high uptake. So we have another event in uh, Istanbul at the beginning of October to meet again with local stakeholders to understand what's the best way to disseminate so that everybody who can use it will be able to have access to it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yan. It's really interesting. I do want to follow up on your remarks with my questions, but I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Chu for his presentation, and he could also tell us uh, the story uh, of the center in Rehanlı, a town, a small town in uh, southern Turkey hosting hundreds of thousands of refugees uh, bordering Syria. But also you have a really interesting scarf, uh, Dr. Chu, around your, your neck. You told us that it was a Syrian refugee who made it. You could also tell us the story about the scarf. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, please allow me to make a presentation here because I need to see the screen. Um, dear my friend, this is a Syrian refugee crisis.
This is why five years ago, we started to work at a small town called Red Honda. Red Honda is next to the border, only with two kilometers. At the same time, Red Honda is also very close to the second biggest city, the Halepo, only with 40 kilometers. So that's why 10 years ago, once we have a Syrian refugee outbreak, a small town at the beginning, they have 100,000 Turkish citizens. They receive 150,000 Syrian refugees. Within these 150,000 Syrian refugees, there are 20,000. They have no chance to register as a refugee. Not just about refugee and the Turkey, but also terrorist group. So that's why this small town, Rehanda, in 2014, there's a two suicide bombing. One destroyed the municipality, another bombing located in the city center and killed 52 people. With the generous funding come from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I work as a volunteer, as a principal architect, to design the building. But at the beginning, from both sides, either the municipality or the government of Taiwan, what exactly, what kind of building we should build? To be honest, we don't know. Because the refugee crisis is a such complicated issues. So that's why I bring my student. Totally, we visit Rehanda 45 times before the construction. I use my own saving to pay the cost as a layer salary, as a layer traveling cost. I still remember the first time we visit, the first NGO is an orphanage. And during that time, because the Turkish government launched the Oliver Branch military operation, so that's why the Kurdish group, they shoot, they use a rocket to shoot the Red Honda. Within three months, more than 100 rockets located on the Red Honda. That's the beginning while we are doing the field work. Two years ago, finally, we started construction. And this is my team, my student. This is also our ambassador in Turkey. I still remember before we started construction, just one month before, this another suicide bombing happened next to our side. If you ask me what is the Syrian refugee crisis, and I say the crisis is about war, the crisis of a war. Today, between Syria and Turkey, 800 kilometers, the wall has been built, and built by the Michigan system, the prefabricated concrete block. But can the war really stop the refugee crisis? Can the war really deal with the refugee crisis? I give you one information. If today, if you are Syrian refugees, if you have 5,000 US dollars, then the human traffic will help you and bring you to the border in one night, they will tell you there's one section of the wall without electricity. So they will put a staircase on one side, put a mattress on the other side. So 5,000 US dollars, you can successfully crossing over the border and enter Turkey. If you don't have 5,000 US dollars, if you dare to approach to the wall, the machine gun will shoot you. In Rehanda, in every spring and autumn, in early morning, you can listen the gun sh shooting in every morning. And this is the Red Hunter. And you can clearly see the border and you see the refugee camp. We use the same war, the military war, the war separating Syria and Turkey. We convert and we transform the war into a humanitarian facility. And we want to use the same military war to create a shared space between two different people, two different nations. And about the war, then we combine with the folded mental sheet. According to the Islamic architecture principle, if you can build the first unit, then you can build the second one. If you can build the second one, then you can complete a complex of a building. If you can complete a complex of building, then you can build a city. This is the Tower Rehanda Center for War Citizens, 52 unit. Each unit is 10 meters high and 6.3 meters in width. The size, the proportion equal to Halepo Umeya Jami. In Rehanda, no matter you are Syrian or you are Turkish, everyone is a Muslim. And everyone, once they see this beautiful vault structure and all the units is facing Mecca, they understand this is their shared space. Even we collect all the broken concrete block on site and 
use the broken concrete block to create a children's playground. Because we want to use this playground to tell everyone, one day all the broken wall will fall into pieces, will fall down. And on that day, our children, the next generation, they can move freely. No burden can stop them. On that day, everyone will be the world citizen, no matter everyone has a different nationality, gender, or religious. Everyone should be equal to each other. Last year, we finished the first phase of construction. For the second phase, we don't know where's the budget. Even we don't have budget to run the building. Then I decided I will take the responsibility. So I continually work as a volunteer and become the funding director of the center and to carry this project and move on. And what we have done is we invite the local NGO, MPO, business sector, and artists, and uh, allow them to move in and build their own shelter within Taiwan Rehanda Center. I know the refugee crisis is a very, very complicated issue. With our own limited resource and capability, we decided we want to help the children first. But how do we help the children? we decided to help their mother first. But how do we help their mother? All the mothers need a job. But what kind of job they can do? And people say, Chow, Syrian refugee, especially women, they know how to do the weaving. So that's why I work with a five local NGO do the weaving work. And I ask, ask our beneficiaries, the lady, why not you create a kitty, a kitty face or meow meow punch? This is their first work. This is called Kitty. This is also called Kitty. This is also called Kitty. So suddenly I realized that there's no cat in Syria because no one knows how to make it, the weaving. <laughs> and fortunately, it is not a green color. If it's a green color, then it's a Master Yoda in Star Wars. <laughs> so no one knows how to do it, actually. So what should I do? So we have a several classes and the training, and the train, and educated the Syrian woman. You are not a worker in a factory. You are an artist. Everyone should do your own style. For example, this lady is called Nasserin, and she has his wonderful blue eye kitty. And then the daughter, Ryan, is this lady. And you can see, actually, her daughter has a beautiful blue eye. And to her, to Nasserin, sorry, to Nasserin, her wish, her wish is she wants to use the kitty to earn more money because the daughter has no leg. Because four years ago, there's one suicide bombing and take the two legs from her daughter. And the daughter needs to continue to do her operation. And today, we have more than 150 ladies finish their own style. And then the Meow Meow Punch also combined with become avatar of all the ladies we work with. So we make a three minutes documentary film. And within this film, all the ladies tell us where they come from and where they have experienced. And I believe if you go to our YouTube channel, we have a more than 100 video has done yet. You only look at one video and it will totally transform your understanding of a serial refugee crisis. Then the Miao Miao Punch now is combined with the Halipo soap. Sorry, Halipo soap. Anyone know what is Halipo soap? And the soap is already um, invented and used for almost 2,000 years since the Roman time. So I tell the Syrian lady, say, because people in Taiwan have no hair. You know, I have no hair. And the Halipo soap is very hard, like a brick. So if you use the Halipo soap to wash your head, then probably you will get hurt. So that's why I tell the lady, we need to make a bunch. So combine with the punch, then Halipo soap. You know, once you're taking a shower, symbolically, just like a kitty kissing your body. <laughs> then, surprisingly, the Halipo soap and our Miao Miao punch, they are sold very, very well in Taiwan. And after the first success of our Miao Miao punch, then we have a wolf wolf scarf. We really try very hard. No matter the, ne the necessary or unnecessary details, we made it. Then, this is adult version. 
This is the children's version, and this is mine. And more importantly, today, the Taiwan Rohana Center, with the generous support again from our government, and also from the generous support from our society, the citizens in Taiwan, we can continue our work. And more importantly, I think to me, I find many, many partners on site to work with me. And allow me to introduce my project manager, Muhammad Wadi Abdi. He's a Syrian 10 years ago because the school has been bombarded. So he left Syria and work and study in Turkey. Last year, I met him. Then he said, Cho, before I met you, I already decided. I will graduate from the university, I will sell all my furniture, and I will go to Izmir because I will buy the ticket, a ticket over the fishing board, and then illegally, and travel to Europe. So I know it's very dangerous. All the boat will be sunk in the ocean, and I have a good body, and I have a very good physical condition. I can swim, and I will arrive in Italy because I hate this place, because of Syrian refugees will never be treated equally. I tell Wali, once you arrive at Europe, you will be treated equally. And he tell me, Cho, you don't understand. I say, Wali, I don't understand. My grandparents, they are war refugees. In 1949, they left China and come to Taiwan. After 45 years, he come back. They come back and they lost all the family members. And the Wadi tell me, Cho, you don't understand what I feel. I say, Wadi, I'm homosexual. My husband and I, we come from relatively conservative Chinese society. We also want to be treated equally. Wadi tell me, Cho, you don't understand. I say, Wadi, I don't understand. I come from Taiwan as an island state country, have not recognized as an independent country. We also searching for the equality in our life. And I tell Wadi, if there's a hope, it's not in Europe. If there's a hope, the hope is in our hand. Let's stay. Let's come back where you come from. Let's try it again. And I say, my friend, join us and let's try it again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chu, for your presentation. I'd like to follow up with my uh, with questions on your uh, remarks, and uh, I'll turn to Mr. Ambassador. And my first question is for you. Uh, there is a, a growing sense of hopelessness among the young Syrian population, and there's been a dramatic rise recently, according to Save the Children. Uh, one in five children. Uh, uh, in Northwest Syria, particularly, according to Save the Children, one in five recorded suicide attempts, and deaths are by children. Uh, is there any psychological support available for these vulnerable children? What can be done? Um, thank you. That's a very, it's a very good question. I touched a little bit <coughs> on that in my presentation. The, the health, the mental health needs um, of of the world are, um, are issues that, that, that are concerning most countries around the world, not only Syria, but Europe, Americas, Asia. Um, but when you have such a hopeless environment, um, the possibilities of being able to move forward and being able to understand uh, your own mental health, deal with it, work with it, get the right support for it. When that support is constantly being taken out from under you uh, by virtue of your lifestyle, by virtue of your environment, uh, it's very, very difficult. And I think more work does need to be done by NGOs. Uh, it, can, it is being done. We're doing a lot of it through the Order of Malta, and I know International Red Cross, Red Crescent, they have uh, a, a lot of opportunities for providing uh, mental health um, counseling and support. Um, there may well be opportunities to use technology um, to provide uh, 
assistance. We have a program at the Order of Malta called Doctor to Doctor, where we align doctors in refugee camps and centers around the world where there are very, very few medical facilities. We align them with doctors in more developed parts of the world where they help them to walk through surgical procedures and walk through diagnostic procedures. Um, and in such a way, they're able to share their knowledge. Um, I am quite sure that we could do more in the counseling world in providing additional online person-to-person -person counseling services using available technologies. Uh, it's an area which is, I'm sure, emerging, but I think it's something that needs uh, far more attention because uh, these vulnerable young people, um, if you have no future, you are not going to have a country. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I'd like to turn to Dr. Yanis. You also talked about technology, and you mentioned that maybe technology could be helpful in dealing uh, with the psychological support to the Syrian refugees. Dr. Yanis, you talked about technology in defining the problems among the Syrian refugees so that you could find solutions. You talked about uh, photo voice, uh, but at the same time, uh, we have a lot of Syrian refugees who have no access to electricity, let alone smartphones or internet. Uh, my first question is, does it make your work difficult when there is lack of technology, lack of electricity, lack of uh, internet, smartphones? And also, how can we use technology uh, to provide maybe mental counseling, psychological support, as well as education. Thank you for the question. Um, it's definitely difficult to try to design what some would see as a high-tech solution for populations that are vulnerable, living in low-income countries, in situations where obviously electricity is not always available, um, but also the, the hardware, I can, you, you would think that not everybody has a phone. Actually, surprisingly, more people have phones than you would think. Um, and this is not just the Syrian refugees across sub-Saharan Africa and in India. Um, having access to a phone and now more and more access to a smartphone becomes ubiquitous. And so developing apps makes more and more sense. And for those who don't have access to a smartphone, there is a way to think about including the community. There is always somebody in the community who has access to a smartphone um, that you could access. So in the context of the Syrian refugees, what we would think, now we did not, we did not reach that level yet. We are still at the, at the process of developing the tool for the people who have the phone. In the future, if I am to think now on stage, I would think about coming up with a community solution where somebody would be identified as having the smartphone and we would provide ways to make sure that the smartphone is always charged and then there is a private moment where somebody could access the smartphone, do private search, maybe using our app or using the internet if the internet is available uh, so that they have access to those services. One of the still, and now I'm jumping into the second question which is uh, mental health and psychological help. I would say one of the silver linings of this pandemic, and there are not many, but there are some, is the fact that now a lot of us have finally understood how much mental health is an issue. Because when the world came to a standstill in March, and we all found ourselves isolated from everyone, from our closest friends, from our family, this is the first time that the world has ever experienced something like this. It, it, it was not just localized in one area. We all, at some point, I believe in April of 2020, 90% of the world population was in some form of lockdown. And so we have all understood this idea of isolation being, being vulnerable. So mental health has probably gone up in um, the interest of most people, and as a result, probably donors. We actually, last year as Columbia, have responded to a call for programs to, do, to use um, apps for mental health, and the idea was to do telemedicine. So in other words, if you feel um, that you're 
having issues of isolation, loneliness, maybe suicide ideation, that you could pick up, again, a smartphone because it requires a video, uh, and be able to talk to an expert. And that expert can be anywhere, can be in the country where you are, or it can be somewhere else, as long as the language is not the issue. I know that some, country, some groups have, uh, are thinking about artificial intelligence in order to try to pick up certain words in text messages to try to find out whether you may have uh, ideas of suicide or depression and basically tell you, okay, do you need help? So that's something that could be exciting in the future. Technology is not the solution. Humans are the solution at the end of the day, whether it is those who spend time developing the, 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 the solutions or those who are on the other end to, to help. The, the tool itself is not going to be the solution, but I'm, I'm happy to, to see that since 2020, mental health has, has uh, gone up in importance. And uh, through the apps and through the technology, hopefully that will be part of the solution. Thank you, Dr. Yanis. Uh, Dr. Chu, I'd like to turn to you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I would like to know if this refugee center, you talked about it, it was not only for refugees, but also for the local community hosting these refugees. Has it helped you bring those two together? Because uh, it's not only you know, food or medical aid to the Syrian refugees, especially after such a long war, and in this case it's been more than 10 years, they also need to uh, need integration and they need to be able to speak the language, learn the language and uh, connect with, with the locals. Uh, has your project helped the refugees and the community connect with each other? My understanding is a Turkish local in Rehanda, they also suffer a lot enormously. I give you one example. The minimum wage in Turkey is 2,500 Turkish lira per month. For a Syrian refugee, a man, if you only pay 1,500, you can hire a man. What's the mean? If we believe there's a pyramid of the social hierarchy in Turkey, in Rehanda, the lowest social hierarchy of a Turkish citizen Basically, their job has been taken by the Syrians. Of course, people in higher power maybe will be fine. So that doesn't mean there's a lot, a lot of a disadvantaged group of Turkish locals, especially women. They don't have a job. So that's why today we work with 150 beneficiaries on site. Among them, I think there's around 30 to 40 they are Turkish ladies joining us and do the weaving all together. And also allow me to respond to your previous question. We only have a low take. We don't have a high take. But the working, allow me to say, is the best therapy on site. Working is the best therapy on site. Because i give you one example. Everyone has been traumatized. Everyone lost your family members. If you have nothing to do, Every day, you just sitting here and you think, you think, and you remember, remember what you have happened in your life. The mental condition definitely get worse and worse. But if you have something to do, you can always be distracted from the trauma you have suffered before. That's the first thing. The second thing is, because you lost your family, most of the cases, you become an individual person. Through this group work, weekly discussion, taking the material, even learning, you rebuild your social relationship or personal relationship. The third thing, the most important thing, everyone need to be recognized by the society with new social economic status. Because everyone, you make something, you earn the money, at the same time, you talk to your colleague and help your colleague, you can be recognized within a group. So, with our very limited resources or capability, what we have done is give the most disadvantaged woman a decent, sustainable, and long-term job. And uh, what I experienced is, for example, last year, we started to do the work. When I entered the NGO, 
all the ladies, basically, even you try to talk to Nan, they just do like this. I, I don't want to talk to you. Because culturally, it's a Muslim society. The woman, even you already covered, you still cannot meet a man outside in the same room. That is the condition. So everyone, even I try to talk to everyone, everyone just do like this. After one year, if you are Cho, they do like this. Hey Cho, we want to talk to you. Cho, the salary you give, the, you give us last year is so great, but this year we have a super infraction. All the food has been doubled. Do you think you can give us a higher salary? <laughs> And within one year, even they dare to touch me and talk to me, Chiu, how do you think about it? <laughs> and I say, sure, I will seriously consider about you know, rising the, the wage. And this is my experience. Hopefully I answer your question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Uh, I want to turn to Mr. Ambassador and talk about the impact of COVID-19 on education. An estimated 2.4 million children were already out of school by the end of 2019, and the COVID-19 crisis has pushed an additional 50% out of education in the north of the country. And we have uh, an ambassador, a lost generation. Uh, we have children who were born into war uh, and have nothing see, uh, didn't see anything but just the war. Uh, do you think this lost generation can be saved? Well, <clears throat> I'm a great believer in salvation. Uh, no matter what the situation is, when you look at human history and you see the great conflicts and the great epidemics and the great plagues and the great disturbances all over the world that have occurred where millions of people have been killed or displaced or destroyed and their livelihoods gone, uh, humanity has a tremendous ability to regenerate itself. Um, a lost generation, yes, I'm quite sure that there will be many, many lives that will not reach the fulfillment that, that they either need, want, or uh, we expect for them because of the pushback on, on, on educational services. But that doesn't mean that people cannot continue to learn. Um, formal education is one thing, but education in general is a lifelong process. It's not something that just occurs between the ages of five and 18. Um, for many, many young people, while they may be disrupted and just think of children during the First and Second World Wars who were moved out of their homes, sent abroad, moved to homes in different parts of the country. Um, their educations were totally disrupted. Uh, and for many of them, uh, it may not have been 10 years, but three or four years, uh, there's a loss there, which many people felt could not be recovered. Um, Education, however, is an experiential process. It's, it's, it's not just a, a transactional event between uh, a teacher passing on knowledge to a student. Uh, it's the experience of living. Um, just as we heard uh, a few minutes ago about the, uh, the children and the young people uh, who are learning through craft, who are learning through creation, who are learning through art, who are learning in different ways than formal textbooks, um, there is still a learning that will go on there, and a learning which in many ways will be transferable at some, at some later point. So there is a danger, of course, of incredible, incredible loss. Uh, and it's up to those of us that are able to provide educational support and help and guidance and to galvanize, to train teachers, to work with teachers. Um, but, you know, just imagine those wagon trains going across the Great Plains of America 150, 200 years ago uh, with those little children uh, in the back of those wagon trains going for months 
without seeing a teacher, without seeing a school, in many ways without even seeing a textbook, uh, being taught by their parents, being given the skills of survival uh, as, they, as they went through their childhood lives until they settled wherever they settled. There's always, there's always hope. Ambassador, I just want to follow up. As a journalist, uh, I've been covering this war from the very beginning, and I visited those camps, and I met children holding guns and fighting. And if there is lack of education, yes, they uh, learn through crafts, through art, and, but if there is no uh, proper education in those camps, uh, it also makes it easier for them to be radicalized. Uh, does that concern you? Do you have any concerns that, you know, uh, w it, the war is also going on because of these radical groups like ISIS, the terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda, and yes. doesn't it make it easier for them to recruit these children? Of course it does. I mean, that's, you know, the young, the, the Jesuits are known for the comment, you know, give me a child until he's seven and I'll show you the man. Uh, if you if you take a child and if you if you work with them if you indoctrinate them if you if you twist their way of thinking uh, to a particular ideology of course it's going to create uh, a whole generation um, we see that perhaps in even in some countries around the world uh, that where indoctrination is is very much a, a part of the national psyche. Um, you ca we can't solve every problem. We can't provide a panacea for, for every issue. What we can do is where we have influence, where we have access, and where we have the opportunity to provide on the ground support, we can make a difference. We can change. Uh, with the demise of ISIS, many of uh, the children of many of these terrorists who had been grilled and trained and born into violence and hatred um, are working with NGO groups who are trying to help them reconcile a, a new way of thinking uh, as a consequence of change. Um, but as I say, it's never going to be perfect and we're never going to have the universal solution. But as long as we have organizations like the United Nations and UN agencies and a plethora of NGOs and people of goodwill, there will always be the possibility of hope, no matter how dire the consequences may seem. Thank you, Ambassador. Dr. Yanis, I'll follow up on that, and I'll stick with education and COVID. Um, uh, even in the most developed countries, uh, we still have problems. Children cannot go back to schools. And uh, when we think about the Syrian refugees, uh, we talked about it, they don't have access to electricity, they don't have access to computers or internet, uh, and they can't go back to school, and they can't have online education. And uh, in this situation, what can technology do? How can it be? Is there a way for... Um, for them uh, to, to help? And how can we use technology in order to help them uh, to provide education? There is always a solution. There is always a solution whether it's using technology or not. If you, if you put people from various backgrounds into a room and you tell them, can you please come up with a solution? They will find the solution. We had that issue, Columbia University and my own center, we have an education team. And the question was, well, how do you do it when these people have no access? They can't go to school uh, and they may not have access to technology. Well, they have access to maybe a television and maybe they have access to a radio. So I know that in Turkey they use that program as well. In India they developed that program where basically once a day for two hours there was a pedagogic uh, program to help children who were not able to go to school. And maybe it's on the radio. In, in our projects across Sub-Saharan Africa, 15 years ago already, we had community radios where basically we had educational programs. So you can come up with solutions. When you don't have electricity, you'll find something else. Uh, maybe you can print out something, distribute, again, work with the community and make sure that it's, it's, it's integrative. Um, so that would be my answer. <laughs> 
Thank you, Dr. Yanis. I'm being told that it's time to open the floor for questions. And if there is interest, any interest from the audience, please raise your hands and introduce yourself. Um, sir, at the very back, if you could just introduce yourself. Thank you, uh, Your Excellencies and colleagues. And uh, I wanted to say that that was really an inspiring as well as a uh, troubling uh, panel and uh, very moving and beautiful projects. Um, uh, my NGO works um, with uh, Rohingya and other uh, displaced populations. And we're Muslim American, so we are also very interested in the plight of the Syrians, even though it's not our focus in work. Um, I'm glad that uh, you know, Taiwan uh, is giving a voice uh, to uh, this discussion and also deserves a voice in the UN itself. I have to say that. Um, and uh, you know, when we see that uh, some of the governments <laughs> sitting or being considered to sit in uh, the uh, United Nations, uh, we certainly would do better with Taiwan and such conversations as today. Uh, my question, though, uh, is about education following up. I'm glad you brought this up. And I think that while you have proposed some very resourceful workarounds for, uh, because of the pushback on education, as was said, this is still not good enough. This uh, government sign uh, treaties and conventions on the rights of the child, and yet they are not responding or providing according to those agreements. And so how do we get to the point where um, uh, nations are abiding by this requirement? Uh, Bangladesh, India, uh, Malaysia are not providing education to Rohingya refugee children. So with Syrians, not to deflect from the conversation, um, how do we ensure that the governments are recognizing that education is a right? Thank you. And this question was for, sir, if you could just... Who would like to pick up? Ambassador, would you like to answer? Dr. Yanis, Dr. Cho. Thank you. Uh, it's... Yes, I think you are, you're absolutely right when you, when you call into question uh, the, the leadership, the global leadership, uh, when it comes to questions like education. Um, uh, sadly, um, and understandably, um, the global leadership is led by states which each have their own criteria, which each have their own issues, and which each have their own particular approach. And these approaches vary, as you well know, uh, within the United Nations family. It is a huge patchwork of differences of diversity, uh, of different approaches, including different approaches to education. Um, whether it's involving segregation, whether it's involving early childhood, whether it's involving higher education, equal access, whatever it is, there are going to be issues and problems. I think organizations like UNESCO perhaps need to be strengthened. Um, I don't think UNESCO has been doing as much as perhaps it could. Um, it's unfortunately fallen into uh, political controversies and issues over the years, uh, which I think have, have weakened um, its mission and, and, and its potential for providing leadership in education. But I think when UNESCO is at its best, it's focused directly on the needs of those who are left behind. Uh, UNESCO's ideas, UNESCO's programs, UNESCO's initiatives, uh, when they have been put into practice, in countries around the world that have needed a boost to their education systems, they've managed to come up with plans and initiatives which have worked. Um, I think there is still a possibility and I think a real need um, for that to, to be regenerated 
um, as, as an organ of the United Nations. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Majid Gili from Rodao Media Network. Thank you very much for this. Um, with uh, you know, more than 10 years of this conflict, there's a lack of interest politically on international stage. When it's come to Syria, the international community is almost becoming numb to the conflict in Syria. And the Syrian refugee crisis is almost accepted as a reality at this point, and the war. Um, I wonder if any of you, since all of you have, are participating in the effort to help the refugees has witnessed a dramatic decrease of funding and donations and uh, uh, from your donors, which I assume they're all international. Um, if you could touch base on that uh, briefly. Thank you. It is increasingly difficult. Um, because, you know, like I said earlier, Venezuela was the topic six months ago. Afghanistan is becoming the new topic. And so, yes, I, I can anticipate that for 2022, 2023, um, fundraising for Syrian refugees may be more difficult. It's not impossible. And we are lucky at Columbia University, for example, that we have a few donors who will... Um, fund a center rather than a particular project. So we are lucky that in our case, our project will not be discontinued. Um, but I can anticipate that that will be a problem. So I don't know whether you also have similar views. We, we need a new story. We, we need a humble but a sincere story. Five years ago, I started to work on the Target Hunter Center project. From the very beginning, I understand it will be very, very difficult to truly complete the building, even manage the program for the building. It's almost impossible. Or oh, allow me to say, I traveled between Gaziantep and Rehanda several times, and I saw so many NGO work. Basically, all the NGO they are doing, doing the charity work. According to the annual budget, how, mu how much money I receive, and how much money we do. And like you said, because now we don't have an international news response anymore. So we don't have news anymore. So that means the funding is getting less and less and less. So last year we do the crowdfunding in Taiwan. You know, it's around 8,000 kilometers between Taiwan and Syria. It's so far away. And many, many of my colleagues tell me, Joe, it is impossible to do the fundraising in Taiwan. Because even in Taiwan, we don't have any kind of law in responding to the refugee at this moment. And how come you can do this crowdfunding? But the story, the real story changed the mentality of the human being. Real story educate the people through sympathy and empathy. People changed, people educated, people cultivated, and people donated money. Last year, we understand we run out of money. We don't have budget to do the second phase of construction. We understand there's no budget to manage the building, but within six months, Thank you for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you for the people in Taiwan. And we raised around one million US dollars within six months. Story and determination. And I believe in humanity. I believe in sympathy and empathy. As long as we have this, we can continue. Funding, no, it should be never be a problem as long as we are determined honest and sincere, there should be no difficulty at all. Are there any other questions from the audience? I don't see any. I'd like to end this panel with a final question to all the panelists. 
Next week, we'll have more than 100 heads of states, heads of governments, ministers coming to New York for the high-level week. Ambassador Dr. Yanis, Dr. Chu, what message do you have to these policy makers to end the Syrian war and to end the suffering of the Syrian people? Ideally, I'd like to hold the General Assembly in a refugee camp in Turkey. Then they would see what the reality is. I think, unfortunately, politicians are good uh, at being elected or re-elected, as the case may be. Um, I think very often uh, they do represent their countries, they do represent their nations, but sometimes it's a struggle to persuade politicians and sometimes global leaders to think outside of their own framework, of their own political, economic, social, or whatever it is uh, that drives their particular mission. Um, I think awareness, the opportunity to talk to people who come from these kinds of environments, to understand and to see the reality of what it's like to look at these sustainable development goals which they will all be paying lip service to and applauding and saying we should be doing more and more and more to get these on the... They need to talk to the people who are left behind. They need to talk to the people who cannot and who will not have the advantage that these sustainable development goals are promising, perhaps in their lifetimes. So I'm not a politician, so maybe I'll be a little bit more harsh. <laughs> um, to say that I have very little anticipation of what the world leaders would do for Syrians. I mean, it has been going on for 10 years. They know about it. It's not like, you know, it has been happening somewhere and it's been kept from them by their staff to make sure that they don't worry too much about the plight of the Syrian people. We know, they know, they don't care. Um, what could we tell them to make them care? Well, it would have to be a pretty good win-win situation where if the situation in Syria does not go back to normal, then there is a possibility of an instability that could affect world you know, peace. But aren't we already almost there or weren't we already there? I mean, ISIS, Daesh, as they call it in France, um, so that's why I said, I, I, I am probably less hopeful. I don't know what kind of message we could tell them because at the end of the day, Syria is so geopolitical, you know, that, that there could have been a solution within a year. They decided not to do it because it was to the advantage of certain powers. And, um, well, who suffers? It's the people. So I'm, I'm sorry, but that will be my answer. <laughs> I think basically I agree with Ambassador and also Yanis' um, opinion. I also believe Syrian refugee crisis is not the responsibility of the global leader. I think it's the responsibility of everyone, including you, me, I mean everyone. What we can do in the future, I believe, is far much more than our imagination now. If everyone, you and me, we can contribute something, we don't need to wait for or beg for the politician to do something. Actually, we are the people, we are the world citizen. We can do far, far, far much more than we can imagine. I must be very humble and honest. I am just a useless architecture historian in my career in the past 20 years. I never designed a building in my life. I never do any NPO or NGO work in my life. I never have any conduct, any humanitarian act in my life. I even don't know how to do the export and the import business in my life. 
But I just say, I know I will fail, but I would like to try. I just spend all my savings in my bank account. I say, I will do it just once because once money is spent out and you cannot do anything. But I say, I will try once because I understand if I don't try it, my life will full of grief. I will regret. Then I say, I try once. I try my best. I don't say Taiwan Rehanda Center can survive in the next few years, but at least in one year, we serve 150 ladies, 150 families, and give them enough food and salary to survive in such a difficult time. I am just a useless architecture historian. I believe all of you can do far much better job than I have done. Then the world will be transformed and changed because you and me, not political leaders, it's because of us. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to have you here, Mr. Ambassador, Dr. Yanis, Dr. Chu. Thank you very much for sharing your firsthand experience from the field and telling us the stories of the refugees. And I, I also want to thank uh, Ambassador Lee and his team for bringing us together. And thank you all for joining us.